Can everyone hear me now? Yes, very good. It's a great day to be alive. Take a moment to just be thankful. Lots to be thankful for. I'm thankful that our, uh, our projection is working here. Um, this is my second computer on our trip. The uh, first one I was locked out of, this one is a rental, and yesterday it decided that it didn't really want to work. So uh, yeah, so something's a little wonky in the, in the visual display. These are, these are uh, recreated, but we're going forward and uh, thankful, thankful that God is with us. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention really quickly before we jump in, I meant to say this yesterday, if as we're having these discussions in chapel, something comes to your mind that you would like to discuss further, or uh, there's something that you would just like someone to talk with about, I just want you to know I'm available. Obviously, there's many people here at Chehi that would be good uh, options, a faculty member, a counselor, uh, that's encouraged, but uh, please know that I am here. I am more flexible in schedule than you, so if you tell me this is when you would like to chat, uh, we can find a time to sit down and talk a little bit. I'd be happy uh, to have that opportunity. Um, wow, so we have been through the, the kind of groundwork, which will continue to influence our studies, and then we have talked about the grand revelation, right? So we've, we've been to the top, and we've seen, okay, this is really what it's all about, right? Everything else that we're talking about this week comes from who God is. So that's part of the structure of the book. And you'll notice that we're not going along in a linear fashion, okay? We are seemingly kind of skipping around, but that's because we're doing a theme study. So as you read 1 John, which maybe you've had a chance to do, you will probably notice that, okay, we're talking about uh, obeying God's commandments. Okay, we're talking about loving each other, you know, we're talking about, and then we're doing it again, right? So these themes keep recurring through the book. I need a little more. Just shout for now. Just shout. Okay, no mic. Is that all right? Okay, I will try to be loud enough. If you can't hear me, just wave and I will try to get louder. If I'm too loud, um, whatever. All right, so here we are. Um, we're going to be primarily looking at uh, some things in chapters 2 and 3 of 1 John, if you want to be there. Um, I'll have an advance here. So I'm thinking about how the elder addresses readers. In fact, I asked a question, or I, I suggested something uh, a couple of days ago, and I'm wondering if anyone followed through. Uh, with this, how many times does John call the readers beloved? Did anyone look that up? Oh, oh, you did, yes. Six is correct. I owe you a prize and I didn't bring them up. If you'll catch me later, I will award you for doing it. Yeah, thank you for your diligence there. Yeah. Excellent. So, beloved, six times. Children comes up, and sometimes little children comes up seven times, so it's even more frequent. And that's just the address where, where John is actually saying children or little children to the readers, that the word actually occurs more than seven times. And the same with brothers and sisters, in my translation, uh, once specifically as an address. So this is telling, right? If we look at the language that John is using, we say, well, why does he keep using these words? And in many cases, the little children or children have to do with the elders' relationship to the community. So, for example, in chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you might not sin. So this seems to imply that kind of elder relationship, that he uh, sees himself really as, as a father in the community. I do want to draw your attention, however, to chapter uh, 3, verse 1, and spend a few minutes there. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. So we see here now that John is including himself as one of the children. And I want to unpack this just a bit. Oh, come on. 
There we go. So look again, it says, we should be called children of God. So I think it's important to ask, who is this we, right? Who is included in children of God in this context? And the verse itself gives us some clues. Look at the contrast. The reason the world does not know us, right, same us as the we just mentioned, is that it did not know him. So now there's this contrast between the world, right, and the children with which John claims to be a part. Now this is important because we can use words and phrases in different ways. So there are some legitimate ways to say any human being is a child of God in a sense, right? I mean, we are, we are created in God's image. Uh, there's a scripture that says God's offspring. So there, there, there is that sense, certainly. And I think it's important because we recognize the dignity and importance of all humanity. That's not the sense that's being used here. So we need to be attentive to this. So, world is another one of those words. In Scripture, world means different things in different places. So, what does it mean here, right? Uh, when we're, we're contrasting the children with the world. Obviously not the planet, right? Um, you have God so loved the world. That's a little different. I think that what John is saying here is derived from this idea that we also see in Scripture as the world being a human-created system apart from God, right? So systems that are built on pride and on self-advancement and, you know, wrong uses of power and love of money and all of these things that just don't look like Jesus. So you have these systems, but then people participate, right? So those who are just fully participating... In the world, in that sense, not living in the way of Jesus. So those are the ones who have not known him. And that tells me, okay, on the other side, what does that mean about the children? Probably obvious here, right? That they are those who do know him. So we need to kind of unpack that a little bit further and, uh, and, I, and it brings the question to me, okay, well, how do I become one of these children? And in Scripture, there are a couple of different pictures that point us that way. Um, there are pictures of adoption and pictures of birth, okay? And both are beautiful and both are important and both are valid, just like in, you know, the human nuclear family, right? There's different ways of entering in. In this case, it's not different ways of getting there, but it's different parts of the picture. I want to follow the birth picture because we're looking at John, so we'll kind of stay in what's called the Johannine literature, right? If we go back to the Gospel of John, we can, we can connect what John is thinking about. So you're welcome to take notes, turn there, but I'm going to just sort of paraphrase and move us forward. Uh, in John 3, Jesus has this dialogue. You probably are most familiar with the verse John 3, 16. The larger dialogue is with a teacher of, of the uh, law in Israel, and he comes by night to Jesus and has this conversation. And uh, Nicodemus, is the person who comes, doesn't actually get a question out before Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born from above, or some translations will say you must be born again, right, or a new birth. So Jesus says that there's something that needs to happen and it confuses Nicodemus. He says, well, how's that possible? Uh, you know, am I going to get back inside of my mother's womb? How does this work? And, and Jesus has a longer explanation that includes being born of, he says, the water and the spirit. And then, of course, you come to, again, John 3, 16, that those who believe uh, wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Perish, like experiencing death, right, but have life. Now, something to point out here, we very often take that verse right into, okay, what happens when you die? 
But read carefully as you go back and study. Death is not really the discussion there, right? In fact, the idea is, while there is a connection, we'll get to the connection. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying these things aren't strongly tied together. But if you look at the dialogue actually being born from above, right? It's heaven coming to you is what Jesus suggests. So that eternal life doesn't begin someplace out there. Eternal life begins now. Eternal life is not just a duration. Eternal life is a quality. And what brings us life is God, right? So it is life with God. It is life in connection with God. It is allowing our lives to be renewed and regenerated. And then Jesus says you can see the kingdom. You can enter the kingdom, right? There is a fullness of the kingdom coming, yes, right? Jesus is the resurrection, As a believer, my life does not consist of only what's on my gravestone between my birth and my death. Right. But it's the kingdom being in us and among us. And okay, now we'll we'll get back to 1 John. We are called to live out this life in a community. Right? We're born in to a family. And that's kind of what we're getting at today. That's who John is writing to. That's who John is addressing. And so we want to see, well, what does this mean? Um, Advance here where I'm caught up with myself. I went a long way without my notes. All right, let's see. Okay, please. (laughs) Am I a flatter? You know what? Thank you. For mentioning that, um, besides the fact that I had to remake all of the graphics, the, my, my thinking with the flat earth was that the world, in this case, are people who are really not living life to the fullest extent. So I actually did have a, a method there for my madness. It's, it's people who are not experiencing life as God intended it, so that, um, you know, we're not against everything out there around us, but we are living in a more uh, full manner when we're living in connection with God. This should have gone yesterday for Clash Day. (laughs) Um, Just a quick couple of examples. What does this look like in in reality, right? What does this look like in the life of a person? And so the book of Acts, I'm not going to spend a long time there, but the book of Acts does give us a couple of, uh, actually several uh, examples of people who come into the kingdom. One is uh, Paul, originally Saul, on the road to Damascus. There's the road to Damascus, who has this encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, right? Not Jesus walking down the road. Uh, He is blinded by the light of Christ, or he at least sees a great light and is blinded, has this encounter, and then Jesus sends him into uh, the community and has someone waiting for him Paul is baptized and and joins the fellowship. This one's purple because another example is Lydia, a business person. That's Acts chapter 9. This is Acts chapter 16. Lydia um, just hears the message. Actually, Paul and and, uh, people traveling with Paul who are sharing the message of Jesus hears it. The scripture says that God opens Lydia's heart to belief and Lydia is baptized not near as dramatic, right? But immediately begins being part of the fellowship, part of the work of God. And, of course, you have testimonies. There are testimonies all around you, right? I have a testimony of coming in and experiencing that life, uh, which the scriptures refer to here again as the new birth. Um, Becoming a child. Let me point you next then to uh, chapter 2, and I'm looking at uh, the verses from 12 and following, and they may be in your uh, text written in kind of a a verse form. It may look like a poem. 
John says, I'm writing to you children because your sins are forgiven. I'm writing to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young people because you have conquered the evil one. I'm writing to you children because you know the father. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I'm writing to you young people because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now that seems maybe a little odd with the rest of John's discourse to, to just find this kind of uh, repeated verse. Uh, this was more common in ancient writings, but I am noticing that, that books coming out now, uh, some authors are coming back to uh, styles that just kind of blend genres like that. We're also obviously uh, familiar with repetition in music, so that becomes my uh, Tchaikovsky connection today. Uh, listen here for the, uh, the, the many ways that repetition comes into this little snippet. In this, this is in the uh, third movement of the Fifth Symphony. <laughs> So repetition here uh, gives us some emphasis, right? And there, I think there's two things emphasized. One is there are these different stages. And the other thing is that John is addressing the whole community, right? The, the whole gamut of, of the community. Now, we're not necessarily here talking about physical children, although children have always been very much involved in the community of faith. But remember, John keeps calling uh, the reader's children, and include himself as a child, right? So children can mean various, various things. Um, it can talk about stages of faith. And by the way, uh, you know, the, the reference here, fathers, depending on your translation, young men, uh, certainly isn't exclusive of the fact that women are fully involved in the community of faith, right? And there are plenty of examples. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Uh, examples of mothers in the faith, for example, uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother. So this is inclusive to say that everybody, right? Every stage is valuable. Now, if we could advance here. Nope, don't want to hear you again. There we go. So think about a baby. Right? A baby is fully part of the family, is a cherished part of the family. I mean, all the baby's doing is, you know, sitting there making noises and, you know, messing their diaper. Well, babies do a lot, right? But uh, they're not producing and giving and contributing in the way that somebody will as they age. And that's okay. So if you look at what the scripture says with children, right, your sins are forgiven. You're just here and you're part, and you're valued, and you're welcome, right? But you'll grow. You'll grow in the faith. And then you have strength, and there's things that you bring, and there's energy, and there's fire that you contribute. But what about people as we get older spiritually, right, and physically? Uh, but as we get older spiritually, as we mature, I should say, spiritually, there's a wisdom. I've been down this road. I can tell you something about this. So it's interesting that John says that you've known him who's from the beginning, right? It shows this kind of a wisdom. I remember when I was in college and I came to faith, I had this experience where now my life was wrapped up in Christ, right? The experience is personal, as was the case in the examples, right? My experience was coming to faith, but then it's also communal. I needed to be part of a community. And so I, the church that I found had one college student, me. And most of the people were over 60. 
And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you wouldn't attract college students like, like that, right? I mean, what's there for college students? For me, grandparents, right? I, I saw college students all week. I went to class with college students. I went to meals with college students. Uh, so, so to me, there was an excitement of that, that intergenerational experience. And, we, and we, this is kind of before, at least in the part of the country I lived, kind of before a lot of the, the contemporary movements in church, which I have no problem with at all. Uh, but even for that day, our church was not contemporary. But I was so excited to just be there, right? I was so excited to just be part of the community, part of the family, um, that that was not, you know, that was not a big deal in my life. Uh, what was a big deal was that I was being uh, nourished and nurtured and related to uh, people who cared about what was going on with me. That was important. The church has a lot of imperfections, so let's, let's make a connection here. The community, the family, right? We also use the word church, and I, I won't unpack all of that, but essentially it is to say that when I've come into a new relationship with God that is about me now perceiving the world, relating to the world in a whole different light, relating to the world as a follower of Christ, seeing things as Jesus sees them, right? This isn't just me. This is done with a group, and I need to find and connect with a group of people who have that faith and that perspective. But we're imperfect. In fact, sometimes in churches, very bad things happen. And I'm sure that there are people sitting here that have been extraordinarily hurt and without time to unpack that I just want to say I'm sorry and that that was not God okay God did not whatever that violation of you that happened God did not do that God did not cause someone to do that and you will probably want if you have not to find someone who you can talk to maybe some professional help in working through those things. It's very likely, without knowing anyone's situation, I'm speaking generally, but it's very likely that a person who's doing that is not connected to God themselves. They're part, they're in the physical community, but they are not in any way representing Christ. We do have other imperfections, though, and, and you know, it, as do all families, as do all human communities, and those could drive us away, but this is my perspective. I haven't been given a choice of whether I'm part of the community, the family of God's people, right? I mean, there are choices of which church to attend and all of that, but I, you know, living this thing out together is integral to the scripture. But I do have a choice of how I contribute to the family. I do have a choice of how I make the experience of relating to each other in Christ uh, for someone else. So just quickly, without going into depth, if you were to look through uh, even just this book, to love one another or care for one another, that's part of what we do. Meeting physical needs, if, if someone lacks and you have, and it could be financial, it could be other, right? It could be someone who visits someone who's shut in. It could be taking care of someone's property that's not able to do that for the time. We testify, as John testifies to us, we encourage one another. We have fellowship Right? Relationships and community that are in Christ, they don't replace our personal connection, but they are not disconnected from our personal connection to Christ. There's more I could say, but I see that we're out of time for today. Uh, so let me just end with this charge. This is not a local church, but there are many here in fact, Chehi is structured to have many here 
who are part of the family of God, right? Mothers and fathers in the faith. Strong young brothers and sisters in the faith. We are part, those of us who have a connection, an authentic faith in Christ, are part of making this experience Christian community. It's important for each other, right? You want to experience community. Others who are in the faith want to experience community. And it's also important, and I say this with complete respect, to recognize not everybody here is at that spot. And, and I say that with respect to each person. But here's what I want to say, and I was there for a long time, folks. I, I went through high school as absolutely not a believer in Christ. I went through part of my first year in college as absolutely not a believer in Christ. Then, then God started doing things, and I started having these encounters. But here's what I want to say. If I'm the person sitting at your table who's not right there at this moment, I'm looking around saying, what does this mean to be the community of faith? What does this mean to be a Christian, not only individually, but as part of a group of believers, a family, and the way I'm welcomed at the table and the way I'm treated will say a whole lot to me about the God that the people around me are professing. So, to those who are faith people, you are in faith in Christ, remember that as you walk through your day and beyond. For those who are not, maybe today, or maybe a day in the near future would be your birthday, and if you want to speak with someone more about, well, what does this mean and how do I come to faith? I mean, it's simple in many ways, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the heart movement. But please speak to someone who can help you and celebrate with you or help answer questions that are kind of standing between you and that place. I know we're out of time, so I'm going to pray. And then don't forget uh, my student, studious uh, person over here to come see me to get your prize later, all right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the family. Thank you for the many good experiences that I and many others here have had relating to the community of faith. Thank you, God, that you've called us to live out the life of faith with others. And Lord, I pray that today, Chehi, even as we're tired, even as we're thinking about other things, can be a place where you are experienced because as we are gathered you are here and we experience your presence in the community. I ask for that and I give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, have a grand day.